Welcome to Stream of Conscience, brought to you by Democracy for America, Fairfield County, where we believe that change is possible and you can make it happen. I'm your host, John Hartwell. Our guest today is Jeff Clements, author of Corporations Are Not People, Why They Have More Rights Than You Do and What You Can Do About It. Jeff is also co-founder of Free Speech for People, a national nonpartisan campaign to challenge the creation of constitutional rights for corporations, overturn Citizens United versus the FEC, and strengthen American democracy and Republican self-government. He served as Assistant Attorney General in Massachusetts from 1996 to 2000, and again from 2007 to 2009, where he worked on litigation against the tobacco industry, unfair trade practices, consumer protection, and antitrust laws. He was a co-founder of Friends of Casco Bay, an environmental advocacy organization in Maine. Jeff graduated with distinction from Colby College and magna cum laude from Cornell Law School. Jeff, welcome to Stream of Conscience. Thank you, John. Glad to be here. So as an attorney, you've worked uh, several times for the interests of the people on behalf of the state of Massachusetts. Uh, what is it that brings you to the private advocacy of uh, Citizens United and corporations are not people? Well, you know, John, when I left the Attorney General's office in 2009 in the summer, I, was, I had been chief of the Public Protection Bureau. And uh, I have to say, you know, the Attorney General and the, the states trying to enforce environmental laws, trying to enforce uh, financial regulation laws, consumer protection laws, public health laws, they're on the front lines of the sort of corporate power take over the increasing difficulty of, of trying to enforce the laws, those laws that still exist for the public interest. And I was going to write an article, actually, a law review article that probably nobody would read, but it was uh, ab about you know, how corporations got this notion of corporate speech rights before Citizens United and other cases that we had dealt with. Um, and so I was um, getting ready to write that article, and the Supreme Court announced that they were going to hear argument, new argument. Uh, in the Citizens United case, that they had changed the entire question in a rather arcane, somewhat boring, <laughs> for many people, campaign finance case into a momentous question about whether they should overrule a century of law, overturn a case only six years old that said we the people can regulate corporate spending in elections. So I took my law review article, put it on the shelf, and did a brief in the case instead on behalf of some democracy groups in the country arguing that, of course, corporations don't have the same rights as human beings, we the people in the Constitution. Unfortunately, as we know now, my point of view lost, um, but the American people haven't accepted that outcome. There's, uh, and the work I'm doing now is really about that. So although I'm in the private sector now, uh, it's actually, uh, mo much of my time is about continuing that debate, continuing that challenge to the question of whether we're government of the corporations or government of the people. So before we talk about Citizens United, because there's, there are level, lots of layers to that particular case, can you sketch out for us how it is that you know, over the 150 years prior to Citizens United, the corporations be began to develop rights that had never been envisioned in the original Constitution? Yeah, it's, you know, it's a, it's a, I've come to see, in report in my book um, that this is really an old struggle. It's a continuous struggle in American history about corporate power balancing, mm -hmm. trying to get corporations, which are very effective tools, they're creations of the state under corporation laws, right. uh, uh, under our state governments, but trying to ensure that as they amass power and wealth over time, because they have advantages like limited liability and perpetual life, uh, that that isn't leveraged into economic I mean, leveraging the economic power into political power. And that goes right back to the founders, James Madison, Thomas Jefferson. They talk, and, and then there was a very early primitive kind of corporations, but they talked about the dangers of corporations. They talked about them as perhaps necessary evils in the economic sphere, but needing to be guarded in the political sphere. And that's how it has been throughout our history. So they pushed for rights. The people pushed back. President Andrew Jackson taking on the corporation, the big, you know, the ba Bank of the United, Bank States, of the United States, because of the yes. danger of leveraging that economic might into political corruption. Theodore Roosevelt taking on the the corporate person doctrine, 
in the last Gilded Age, much like our own, the last Gilded Age where corporations did leverage, the railroad corporations, the sugar trust, the oil monopolies, leveraged that economic might into political domination, and it took the progressive era um, with Republicans, Democrats coming together to push back. Theodore Roosevelt, a Republican president, getting the Tillman Act, which prohibited corporate spending in elections, and you know, Democrats like President Wilson continuing that, that fight. And, and so this is a, a common theme throughout our history as, as Americans. And so corporations try to usurp rights in our Constitution. The people push back, as, as we should. And, and that has continued right up. We had the New Deal that kind of finally won the fight over the Gilded Age creation of corporate people in our Constitution. And then this new one that ended in Citizens United. I see Citizens United as the end game of the last 25 to 30 years, where a whole new corporate rights concept in the Constitution has usurped the rights of we the people. And fortunately, Citizens United is actually an opportunity because they said out loud what's actually been happening, and people are ready to push back. Uh, you mentioned the Gilded Age in American history, and of course that's the, the period following the Civil War and the run-up to 1900 or so when the great families in New York and Boston created vast amounts of wealth in a, in a governmental system that had very little controls. Um, that's when uh, Newport was built, that's when you know, lots and lots of mansions that up and down the East Coast were built out of money that, that came out of corporations and where corporations basically ran the government. Um, and the pushback in the progressive era was uh, very, very important. And we had things like, for example, the, the uh, income tax that was passed as a constitutional amendment. Uh, the ability of women to vote was, was put in place. Uh, there were lots of things that were done as part of this overall push of the progressive era 100 years ago. And one of those things was to the, uh, a federal law that says that you couldn't, that corporations couldn't donate money to uh, campaigns. And it, I think at the same time, there was a Montana uh, uh, constitutional amendment in their state uh, that, that said that you know, corporations couldn't give money. And at that time, when we had the um, this U.S. Senate was in many cases bought and sold because the state legislatures at that time were the ones who chose senators. Now, they weren't, they weren't directly elected. That's another constitutional amendment that we had about 100 years ago that completely changed the dynamic of the political scene. So there was a lot that went on then, and from that time on, I think corporations have been fighting back and taking more and more power back away from the people. Um, so Citizens United, tell us, give us the overview. What does it actually say? Well, what happened, John, and I, I want to come back to um, the constitutional amendment efforts and that succeeded in the progressive era that you mentioned, because okay. that's so important, such an important lesson for us today yes. and what we need to do today. And the reason we need to do it is because of Citizens United. What, what, and, and what Citizens United did, is, the case is called Citizens United versus FEC, as you know. And what it F did... FEC is the Federal Elections right, Commission. the Federal Election Commission. And, right. and the case uh, was about whether we the people in the McCain-Feingold, the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, can ban within certain windows before an election corporate independent expenditures, so-called. Um, we now see in the super PACs, there's nothing independent about them. They're coordinating right. with, campaign, with right. candidates and campaigns. But in theory, the Supreme Court and Citizens United said, oh, this is not corrupting if corporations spend unlimited money in our elections because it's not on behalf of candidates, it's not like a contribution, there's no quid pro quo or, or corrupting effect. A total fantasy land about what actually happens in right. politics. As people like John McCain have said, this is not a, a partisan issue. Both, both sides, I think, recognize that, of course, unlimited corporate spending has a corrupting effect. But the Supreme Court and Citizens United didn't get that. Five to four, they struck down the McCain-Feingold Act. They said that we the people, whether in Congress or in the states, aren't allowed to regulate corporate spending in elections, that we're not allowed to limit that unlimited corporate spending in elections because according to the Citizens United majority, Justice Anthony Kennedy wrote the decision, that would violate corporate speech rights. It and where do corporate speech rights come from? How could a corporation have rights like people? Well, for that, you have to go back to 1970. I, t I tell the story in my book where 
Um, you know, in April 1970, 20 million Americans came out into the streets to celebrate that first Earth Day. Yes. Not really to celebrate, because there wasn't re reason to celebrate. Rivers were catching on fire. We had oil spills off Santa Barbara. Right. The air was so toxic, it was killing kids and elderly and others. And 20 million Americans came out to say, enough. We're going to have a better deal, a better balance between, you know, corporations externalizing all the toxics and keeping the profits. And we had an amazing wave of successful democracy, mm. Clean Water Act, mm. Clean Air Act, EPA, mm. Safe Drinking Water Act, on Un and under on. Under President Nixon, by under the way. Under President Nixon, exactly. Mm. And the corporate speech doctrine that had its final you know, success, its ultimate success, because it took elections in Citizens United, actually started as a reaction to that. Lewis Powell, a mm. corporate lawyer in yes. Richmond, Virginia. Who later became a Supreme Court judge. That's right. He mapped out a game plan for his client, the Chamber of Commerce. He was on the board of a dozen corporations, including Philip Morris. He mapped out a concept of using what he called activist-minded Supreme Court to change the legal, economic, and social structure in America. Mm. Richard Nixon put him on the Supreme Court six months later. He wrote four decisions in the space of about six years, first time in American history, striking down laws based on a corporate speech theory, a corporate rights theory. It struck down environmental laws. It struck down a law in Massachusetts in a case called Bellotti versus First National Bank of Boston that restricted corporate spending in citizen referenda. And the citizen referenda at issue at the time, 1978, was whether we should have a progressive income tax in mm. Massachusetts. Mm. Nothing to do with corporations, mm -hmm. but corporations, Gillette, Bank Boston, and Digital Equipment Corporation funded following the Powell game plan, a attack on that law, an attack on that law, arguing that it violated corporate speech. Lewis Powell wrote the decision, five to four, struck down the law. It was the first time in American history, 200 years, you know, we just celebrated the bicentennial, 1976. Mm. Two years later, first time in American history, a state or federal law restricting corporate spending in elections had ever been struck down. That doctrine, that was the birth of corporate speech. It went on to strike, as I said, eliminate environmental laws, eliminate public health laws, and then finally, with Citizens United, eliminate any kind of restriction in our election laws of corporate money. And just to be clear, um, in the run-up to Citizens United, there were plenty of, for example, political action committees, PACs, so-called, where there was lots of money sloshing around in the system. And individuals could give money to PACs, PACs could pull that money together, and then they could go to a candidate and, and put money on the table. So it wasn't like that the people in the corporations were somehow not benefiting from free speech. In fact, um, I remember when I used to work for a major bank that you know there was a message coming out from the head of my part of the bank every year, you know, please give money to our, our PAC, which I didn't do, but the point was is that there was plenty of speech already on behalf of corporate interests through these political action committees. Uh, but now the treasury of the corporation itself is completely open. So let's take an extreme example, Apple, which currently has a hundred billion dollars in the bank. They have cash of $100 billion. At one point during the summer, they had more cash on hand than the federal government. Apple could, if they wished, deploy that money in every single election in this country, from U.S. senators, if they wanted to buy a U.S. senator, governors. They could buy whole state legislators uh, you know, at a whack. They could go to mayors. They could go you know, whatever, boards of, of, of education, anything they wanted, they could spend that money on if they so chose. And there's nothing to hold them back. Yeah, that's absolutely right. It was illegal until Citizens United. Citizens United struck that down. So that now Apple, you know, Walmart with 420 million, billion, I'm sorry, 420 billion dollars in revenues annually. Um, you add these, you know, the corporate treasuries up, and we're talking about trillions of dollars that can be used and, and secretly. There's no disclosure regime right now. now. Um, the Citizens United opinion, wasn't, that, wasn't there a presumption that it was also going to be open? There would yeah. be transparency? Yeah, it's an interesting question, John. The, the Citizens United has at least three underlying principles that Justice Kennedy used to wa justify the case. Um, none of which are actually true or have actually come to pass, just the opposite. So he said, don't worry, there'll be disclosure. Mm. 
Well, there is no disclosure. So transparency. So transparency, not, exactly. Not there. Not there at all. Right. It's don't worry. I'm, we're not saying that you can't restrict foreign money coming into elections. Well, in reality, out here where the rest of us have to live with their decisions, foreign money, you know, to think of a, the kind of global corporations that we're actually talking about, the threats to democracy don't come from the, m many American small businesses. That's about global multinational corporations trying to get advantage. And that money, you can't call foreign or domestic, it is, you know, sh global corporations have global shareholders. The number two shareholder of News Corporation, which gave a million dollars to the um, chambers, na the U.S. Chambers Election Fund, gave a million dollars to the Republican National Gover Governors Association. The number two shareholder of News Corporation is the Kingdom Holding Company of Saudi Arabia. They have two billion dollars in shares. The number one uh, shareholder in Citibank is also a Saudi. Well, that's right. So and, and UBS is the Republic of Singapore's sovereign fund. Right. So we had to, to, to delude ourselves that somehow don't worry foreign money won't influence our elections is just wrong so you had and then the the, the last one, biggest yes. the biggest sort of um, you know delusion that guided the Supreme Court in this decision is the notion that I already said where independent expenditures are just deemed with a wave of the wand to be not corrupting not or corrupted. having the appearance of corruption right. because they're quote unquote independent. independent and you mentioned Montana what we're seeing in Montana where they're fighting back the, the attorney general is defending that law you mentioned, that 100-year-old mm. law. Mm. It's on its way to the Supreme Court. They presented reams of evidence showing how corporate money corrupts, whether it's spent independently or handed as so-called independently or handed in a bag to, a, to a, a state legislature. There's not much difference. And so, you know, hopefully the Supreme Court will re-examine and want to decide the Montana case based on facts and evidence rather than on ideological zealotry, which is what is behind Citizens United. So beyond hoping that the Supreme Court is going to change its mind now that it's seeing exactly what's going on, what else can we, should we be doing to, to get this fixed? Yeah, number one, I, I, I propose three essential legs of a stool, if you will, for renewal of our democracy, which is what we need in yeah. response to Citizens United. And I think Citizens United actually gives us the opportunity to do it because the reaction to it is um, viscerally hostile. The, Amer the American people do not like global corporations messing in our elections. W Americans don't like being pushed out of the election and the debate because money is everything. And we've done some polling at Free Speech for People that shows 79% of Americans support a constitutional amendment to reverse Citizens United. And that includes Republicans, it includes Democrats, it includes Independents. So number one, we need, this is a power struggle. We've been given a, a, a constitutional mm -hmm. proposition about who has power in this country. Mm -hmm. And that proposition is corporations are people under the Constitution. You're not allowed, we're not allowed to decide for ourselves after a debate what the right balance is. Um, that's a proposition we can live with, or we can say, no, that's not going to work in government of, for, and by the people. We have to overturn it. The way we do that is the People's Rights Amendment, constitutional amendment. Number two is get the money out and get public money in to elections. Number three is re-examining uh, corporate law. Really, we have to remember these corporate advantages are created by us under our state laws. We need to look at some interesting new ideas like for-benefit corporations, questions about whether Delaware with 900,000 people ought to be writing the rules for 310 million people in America, not to mention the billions across the world who live with the consequences of Delaware corporate law, which most of the biggest corporations in the world use. We have to have a debate about that because corporate law sounds dull, but it's actually what's driving almost everything in our lives these days. So. Constitutional amendment is, is happening. People are signing on to this campaign. Legislators are getting behind it. Um, and we have to do what our, the progressive era did and, and, and do the heavy lifting of a constitutional amendment or see you know, the hard work of trying to build a democracy go down. And, and let's go back for a moment to the progressive era and, and the direct election of U.S. senators. Yes. Because as I mentioned earlier, for the first, I don't know, 150 years or so, not quite that long of, a, of the American Republic, 130 years maybe, senators were chosen by the state legislatures, 
and they were meant to represent the states. They weren't re meant to represent the people. And the original concept of the Constitution, I think, is very clear that, that you know, the Senate was seen to be a representation of a state and not of the, not of the people directly. And in the progressive era, in the, in the 1900s, early 1900s, we were able to pass a, an amendment to the Constitution. But an amendment to the Constitution usually starts, has always started, doesn't have to, but has always started in Congress, being passed there with a two-thirds vote, I believe, That's in right. both houses of Congress. And then it's sent to the states for three-quarters of the states to, to ratify. Now think about that for a moment. The constitutional amendment was going out to state legislatures to ratify. That was going to take power away from the state legislature, the, the power to elect the senator, and put it directly into the hands of the people of that state. So it was not on, the, on its surface an amendment that had a, a much uh, interest from the state legislatures. They had to be forced by the people of the states to actually pass that amendment. Uh, and so I think even as difficult as it sounds today to get a constitutional amendment passed for corporations and, and making sure that they have no more rights than people do and fewer in, in some cases, it's a heavy lift because of the Republican state legislatures around the, around the country. Uh, I think it can be done. It just needs, we need to be really vigilant and demanding at the state level that this get done. I think that's absolutely right, John. I, we, and it is getting done. In New Mexico, um, we had a vote in the House of Representatives in New Mexico and in the Senate in New Mexico. It passed constitutional, a resolution demanding that Congress send to the states for ratification an amendment to overturn Citizens United. It got some Republican votes, too. So this is happening, and I think you're absolutely right about the examples from the progressive era, and I can give other examples as well, but they did four constitutional amendments in the space of a decade. Right. And one was kind of dumb, the prohibition one, but we fixed that with another they amendment. I undid that one. Yeah, right. but the ones you mentioned, it's, you're absolutely right. The men in the Senate who had been appointed in smoke-filled and money-filled rooms in state legislatures voted by two-thirds to give an amendment that said women get the right to vote, another amendment that said senators will be elected. They didn't do it because they wanted to. They right. did it because the American people built this national state-by-state, town-by-town movement that we're doing now across the country to take on Citizens United. And y your income tax example is another great one because if you think this is hard, imagine being the folks who had to get a constitutional amendment for an income tax. Right. Um, you know, the American people aren't, aren't dumb. Right. We know what I'm we need to do taxes. to make democracy right. work, right. Even, if it, if, even if it's sometimes hard work and not always tasty medicine. Um, and I think this is one of those times where, you know, Americans are, are, are asking, um, you know, for opportunities to try to save our country. And we're not getting it from our politicians, but we're building it in this kind of amendment work across the country. You mentioned Madison in the beginning, and he's here in the foreword to your book that uh, um, was written by Bill Moyers, who is obviously a wonderful uh, and very important person. Madison said he feared that the spirit of speculation would lead to a government operating by corrupt influence, substituting the mo motive of private interest in place of public duty. Um, I think that those words are just as important today as they were then, perhaps even more so, because we're actually seeing it today happen. And I think in Madison and Jefferson and all of the founding fathers would be appalled at the situation we find ourselves in. Yeah, I think absolutely. And, you know, I think, um, especially James Madison, he's often credited with writing much of the Constitution right. and his, and his, his thoughts about why we have the checks and balances and the Bill of Rights for human beings, not corporations, it really comes out of his, his theory of faction and his concern. Um, it, the, the words you just quoted were really reflecting, you know, the democracies usually failed in human history. And so the founders were trying to look at why did they fail? What, what causes failure? And one of the biggest is unleashed faction. Now, faction is private special interest and, and they accepted that's inevitable, but you had these balances. And what happens with corporate power, corporate rights, is it unleashes the most formidable faction the, the world's ever seen. Uh, you know, your, your hundred billion dollars of Apple money. They, James Madison could not have imagined never. that kind of power, and, and he never would. I mean, the thought that somehow the founders would have thought it made any sense at all to give those kind of uh, 
entities, state-created factions with unbelievable power, the same rights as people in this fragile democracy, government of, for, and by the people, it's inconceivable. And, and so, you know, if we really want to look at original intent or the meaning of the Constitution to try to make it work, uh, there's no way this proposition that Citizens United has put before us can stand. It will be overturned either by a constitutional amendment or a change in the court. Well, in order for people to learn more about this, I think they need to read your book and uh, get working at the local level. There are lots of groups out there that are working on this. Move to Amend, for example, is one. Your group, right. uh, Free Speech for People, is one. Um, I know Common Cause is working on this uh, as a national issue. Uh, Democracy for America is behind this. Uh, you know, Move On, I'm sure, is signed on to this. So there's lots of groups out there, and I urge people to get your book and read it and then get working on it because this is something that needs to be done. We, we cannot wait. Thank you, John. I quite agree. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Good to be here. That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to learn more about progressive, grassroots political action, please check out our Democracy for America group. We meet the first Wednesday of the month at the Silver Star Diner in Norwalk, and we'd love to have you join us. Remember, change is possible, and you can make it happen. This has been Stream of Conscience, and I'm your host, John Hartwell. Thanks for watching.